Hertz has got it, wants to throw. Hertz setting up the screen. It is complete and blown up. Miles Sanders caught it. Malcolm Rodriguez was there waiting for him. That's a big play by Rodrigo. Welcome to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. It is week four in the NFL, and the Lions are going to try to get back on track to 2-2 two and two after a tough defeat, honestly, last week against the Minnesota Vikings. A game I think everybody in the building thinks they should have had. But as always, I'm going to start with news and notes on this week's podcast. And you can't go much farther than the injury report when you talk about the Detroit Lions and, and this matchup with Seattle on Sunday. It's a hurt Detroit Lions t- uh, team, especially on offense. I mean, you just look at the skill position. Um DeAndre Swift, no practice Wednesday, Thursday. Amon Ross St. Brown ankle, no practice Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, DJ Chark, split practice. It was good to see um, TJ Hawkinson back Thursday after missing Wednesday. It was good to see Josh Reynolds back Thursday after missing Wednesday. But, you know, still we have to see how those ankles respond now when they come back to practice. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, th- I don't think the Lions are, are out of the woods yet. Um, I think it's encouraging, you know, with guys obviously like Hawkinson, with Josh Reynolds. We'll have to see about Chark. I never liked the fact when a guy practices on Wednesday and then doesn't Thursday. It just doesn't always sit well with me. We'll obviously have to see Friday if he's back on the practice. It'll make me feel better. Could just be one of those things they want to rest him, get him to Sunday. But uh, really all eyes on the injury report this week. Um, you know, a couple other ones. Austin Siebert, um, their kicker, dealing with a groin. He didn't practice Wednesday or Thursday, so that's something we'll have to monitor too. No Jonah Jackson. Even though I did talk to him in the locker room Wednesday, he kind of explained, you know, why it's not you know one of those cases where he can just you know cast it up and play with it being his right hand and and and, you know being at that that left guard spot just how um you know that right hand is so important in pass defense and grabbing on and and he really kind of explained the difference you know between the usage of the right hand and the left hand and why it's it's worse to have that injury on the right hand so I think he's still going to need a little bit of time before he's really comfortable stepping in there and 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 battling and, and keeping guys off Jared Goff on the interior you know Kaminsky, like I mentioned, I think that was a huge loss. And I talked about it in last week's podcast, just how much they were going to miss him. And I thought we saw that on the field in Minnesota. You know, he led the team the first two weeks in pressures. He's kind of that guy that really sets up all their stunts and games inside. And um, they just didn't have that. So, look, he's not on IR, which is a great sign. That would mean he's out for four weeks. Um, Not great. For this week, I think still, you know, maybe there's a surprise late, late week. We'll have to see with that one. Um, but one to, to continue to monitor. Um, again, I think good news on Hawk. We'll see on chart. Good news on Reynolds. Chris Board, um, who missed practice on Wednesday, was back Thursday. That's good sign for the defense. Um, he's kind of their third down specialist. I, I went through the rankings this week on, on Pro Football Focus, and, and look, I think he was like four or five among all linebackers. A lot of that's you know being in on third down and the coverage he provides, but but that's a big spot in today's NFL. And so getting him back was was big news for that defense. But you know, obviously the big ones will be no Swift, no um, Amon Ross St. Brown. That's your lead receiver that's your leading running back um Detroit obviously feels good about you know Jamal Williams and what he did last week stepping in 20 um rushes for 87 yards two touchdowns just kind of fit in seamlessly um when, when when Swift was was pretty limited and then added that shoulder injury to the ankle he's already dealing with um so I think they still feel pretty good there you know we'll just have to see is, is Khalif Raymond ready to kind of step into the slot I think you know Quintez Cephas has has proven in this league that he can step in and, and perform when needed. And, you know, I think a, a, a big week could be in store for TJ Hawkinson. That's just my prediction. If there's no Amon Ross St. Brown, if there's no DeAndre Swift, watch for TJ Hawkinson, who, who only has, you know, 10 catches, 82 yards, and a touchdown through three weeks. Pretty slow start to the season for him. Um, you know, if they don't have Amon Ross St. Brown, I, I, I could maybe see TJ Hawkinson getting a lot more looks in the middle there. Um, this is a, a Seattle defense that um, is without a, a bunch of their veteran stars. They're, they're rebuilding building, reshaping that unit over there. There's going to be some opportunities, I think, for Detroit, especially in the run game. So we'll just kind of see where that goes. But I think stay tuned Friday for the injury report. That's going to be a huge one for Detroit. I think those injuries are obviously the huge storyline here. Um, in Detroit, I think you know a close second is is you know some defensive improvements that that continue. 
to have to be made. Um, you know, this is Detroit Lions defense. You just look at some of the statistics, 32nd in points, um, 28th in total defense, 27th against the run, 25th against the pass, last in red zone defense. And so, look, we talked to defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn on Thursday, and, and he said, look, you know, the miscommunication has been an issue, obviously. We saw it at the end of the um, game there with uh, Juju uh, Juju Hughes and Mike Hughes kind of miscommunication between the safety and the slot there allowed um, the, you know, the Osborne touchdown. But I, I credit Aaron Glenn with saying, hey, I could, I could say it's miscommunication and end the conversation there, but it's not. It, it's, it's about execution too. And he wasn't just referring to the players. He was referring to himself and those defensive coaches as well. And, you know, I, I credit Aaron Glenn for, for standing up there and kind of saying, hey, I think everybody on that side of the ball from the players to the coaches has to be better. And now you get an opportunity this week. Now, Geno Smith is a veteran quarterback. They've got some weapons on the outside, obviously, with Tyler Lockett um, and and DK Metcalf, but it's a young offensive line. Um, Geno Smith isn't a guy that, that's going to come out and, and throw for 400 yards and, and be that guy. At least he notoriously isn't. He's kind of a guy that, that stays on schedule, completes a lot of passes, throws it to the right spot, but it's not an explosive offense under him. At least that hasn't been the first three weeks of the season. So you've got to like to think there's some opportunities there defensively. Now Geno can get out of the pocket, run a little bit. So um, like they faced with with Philadelphia, I think they've got to be disciplined in that regard. But but really, I think Detroit needs a bounce back performance defensively. I think they've shown it in stretches. Obviously, the first half with Washington was terrific. We've seen it in spots, but they just haven't been able to kind of finish when they needed to uh, make that play to end the game, much like the offense couldn't last year. So I'm not putting it all on the defense. Um, but that's the side of the ball I think has to be better. You look at some of the offensive numbers, second in points, third in total yards, third in rushing. I mean, they're up there. If this defense can just get marginally better, I think this football team overall is much better. So I look at that side of the football to, to really – try to have a bounce back performance against Seattle and, and kind of go into the into week five and then obviously the week six by you know feeling a little bit better about yourself if you can have another performance um, in Boston against New England week six. Uh, speaking of the defense, you know, I think one of the big storylines this week, too, is Jeff Okuda and just the way he's played um, the first three weeks of, of the season. Obviously, the number three pick in, in 2020 has dealt with injury, um, but he's been really stout. Um, he's been the Jeff Okuda, in my opinion, and watching him on tape that the Lions thought they were getting with the number three pick in 2020. He's been that good. You look at what he did with, t- uh, you know, covering Justin Jefferson last week, um, targeted four times. Jefferson was caught two for nine yards. He was equally as good um, the weeks before against Devonta Smith and and Terry McLaurin. Um, you know those are guys that are you know really good receivers in this league. And 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 Jeff's been terrific. You know through the start of the season, 36 yards on average. Jeff is giving up per game, zero touchdowns, and quarterbacks have a 74.6 passer rating when throwing his way. I'll take those numbers every day of the week and twice on Sunday. And so he's been good. And I think that allows. Aaron Glenn to do some things defensively that maybe you can't do. And, you know, we'll see what the matchup is with with him and DK Metcalf. And DK Metcalf made it a little interesting this week with some of the comments that he had when asked about Jeff Okuda. Said, hey, look, he's a good corner, but shut down, I don't know. He's got a safety over the top, so I, I wouldn't call him that. I'm sure those comments will get their way to Jeff. They've already gotten their way to Aaron Glenn. So um, we'll see kind of what that matchup involves. And how much Jeff is on DK, how much he's on Tyler Lockett, who's actually their leading receiver. So I think, you know, it's a really good matchup for Jeff, and can he kind of keep it rolling? I think that's one storyline to watch this week. And then finally, you know, I I think strength versus weakness. That's what what I always look for in a matchup. And when you look at the Detroit Lions the first three weeks, what's their strength been offensively? Obviously, we already talked about it, but more specifically the run game. Um, Detroit's third in the league um, rushing the football. They average 170.3 yards per game. And that is Seattle defense that I bet most Lions fans won't recognize. Um, you know, a lot of those veteran guys in the secondary, a linebacker, are no longer there. It's very much a young defense, kind of a rebuilding um, team over there in Seattle, much like Detroit was last year and, and really still is defensively this year. But when you look at Seattle defensively, 157 yards per game they are allowing on the ground. That's the third worst in the NFL. So you've got an offense that's the third best running the football. You've got a Seattle 
NFL defense that's third worst. Obviously, with some of the injuries we talked about off the top, that's something that you know Ben Johnson and the Lions are going to want to establish and want to try to you know, maintain and be the core uh, of this week's offensive, you know, attack and scheme because of some of the injuries you're dealing with uh, on the outside at the receiver position. So um, that to me is a big one. Can Detroit establish that run like they have in all three games this year and then, you know, work some of their play action? You know, Jared's really comfortable, um, you know, once you establish that run and and, and now you can do play action and, and you can play off that run. That's where he's at his best. So I think that's huge for this Lions team. Um, this week, can they establish run? Can they stay with it? Um, you know, I listened in on Pete Carroll's um, you know media address on Monday, and and he's made that a big emphasis with this defense is is stopping the run and being better there. So those are two really uh, really big key. Um, Key, key issues for, for both team, you know, who can step up and be better in that regard. So, look, those are the news and notes, you know, heading in. Um, I'm going to have uh, Michael Sean Dugar from um, The Athletic in on this podcast. Uh, he's going to preview the matchup from a Seattle perspective. I got a couple players coming in to, to talk a little special teams, talk a little offense, and we'll obviously have the MGM uh, key matchups too. So, we got a busy show for you for sure. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. I am here with Michael Sean Dugar from The Athletic. He does a great job covering everything Seattle Seahawks out there in Seattle. Michael Sean, thanks for joining me. Great, uh, great to have you on and, and give a little perspective here. I have to start with this. I turn on the tape, start watching a little bit of Seattle, and I still can't get used to not seeing Russell Wilson at quarterback. How long did that take you guys out there in Seattle to get used to that this year too? Yeah, a few, a few, I'd probably say a few weeks in the OTAs, honestly, I got just, it was just very hard. Him and Bobby Wagner, um, yeah. I was just so used to those to, to three and 54, just being like the guys out there. It was, it was very strange. Um, it's just, Rush just is so, like, if you drive past Lumen Field, there's these huge, like, probably 70 foot, you know, like, posters of maybe not posters but you know what i mean it's like superimposed images of like the stars and yeah. for so long it was russell and and richard sherman and cam chancellor and marshawn lynch and even Dwayne brown the last few years and bobby kj Wright, and it's just they're all gone so it's not even just that there's no rust like the whole the whole image of the franchise has been reshaped you know that it, it kind of in pete carroll's image which is weird because usually the most famous person on a roster in the NFL is usually a player. And right now the most famous person in uh, on the Seahawks is the coach. That's a college thing kind of. Yeah. So, you know, the two similar teams in that regard with Detroit, you know, obviously Dan Campbell's in his second season, but, but, you know, still building something. I think they're kind of still in that, you know, retool, rebuild, reshape phase. Obviously Seattle's going through that now. Now you've got two teams, both at one and two, looking for a huge win. Just how big of a game is this for the Seattle Seahawks this weekend to kind of get things right after, after not being able to come up with a win, you know, last week against the Falcons. Oh, it's, it's, it's monumental. Um, I have a, I have a like a templated, like four store four games in story that I have to do. Um, it's it's due on like Tuesday or something like that, and I'm gonna pre-write some of it. But the tone of it is gonna be so different at one and three versus two and two. You know, that's just gonna be huge. You know, because it's like a, it's like a four games in check-in. How's your team doing? Well, at one and three, they're kind of screwed. You know, at two and two, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's just such a big difference between. Uh, it's almost like a swing game. Uh, in that regard. And I think, and both teams probably feel this way to an extent, like both fan bases and coaches and players probably feel like the other team is one of the winnable games on the schedule. The coaches obviously think they can win every game, like, right. but like in Seattle, let's be honest, you don't want to lose to this, that Falcons team. And you don't want to lose to this Lions team. You know, like there's just a perception about both of those franchises and the state of those two teams and the both teams are second year head coaches and obviously rebuilding this team does not want to lose to those guys. They just got it handed to them by Atlanta. In that context, losing to Detroit would be, that would be devastating. There would still be 13 games left on the schedule, of course, like logistically, but that would, that would stink because in their minds, it would be like, man, if you can't beat a rebuilding Falcons team at home and you can't beat a rebuilding 
uh, albeit respectable rebuilding, you know, Lions team, who the hell are you going to beat in this in this league? Whether that's fair to Detroit or not, I'm just saying that that is the the perception. Um, and if you, yeah, so in that regard, this is a huge game for Seattle. No, I think it's a great point by you because I think that they feel the same way here in Detroit. At two and two, with one more game to go in New England, obviously they're dealing with some injuries there, and then Detroit's got an early bye, week six. So I think you feel better even at two and three. Obviously, three and two, you feel great. You know, going into that bye week, you know, you lose this game, a game that Detroit's favored at. There's not been a many, a lot of those, you know, the the, the last few years here. Um, so I, I agree with you. It's a huge game for, for both teams. And, you know, we talked about Russell Wilson off the top. And, I, and I'm just interested with the impression of, of Geno Smith has been obviously completing 77% of his passes. He's not Russell Wilson, even though he does have a currently a higher passer rating than Russell Wilson, who struggled a little bit there in Denver. But I'm just curious what, what, what the perception of him has been. He, he seems to have kind of you know been a been a steady next step as as they kind of search for for what their next step is long term there in Seattle at the quarterback position. So like long like big picture, if I had to say the the biggest slice of the pie in terms of Geno perception outside of the building, outside of the building is totally different from inside the building. But outside the building, I would say it's that all right, Geno's a placeholder. We, we just want him to be competent, you know, but ultimately we're looking down the road, we as in like mostly fans and stuff to, a, you know, a Bryce Young, a CJ Stroud, uh, the kid, kid from Kentucky, whatever, even the kid from Stanford. And like we're looking down the road. The future of the franchise is probably living in a college apartment. That's the like the general outside feeling. If you're just asking about how I feel about his play, he's actually played okay. And I think there's no consensus on that. Uh, I think some people are like this guy stinks. Some people are like, well, look at his numbers. He's really efficient. Um, the the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. I think the, my fascinating thing with Gino, just from my view, not necessarily a perception everyone else has, is that he is exactly what a Pete Carroll quarterback. Like if if Pete Carroll, you take his philosophy and like, okay, what kind of quarterback does that? Oh, it's Geno Smith, guy who's like twenty something in air yards per attempt, hasn't thrown a touchdown in the second half. Uh, but is like top five in lowest per, uh, lowest rate of um, um, what's the what's the word I want to use here? It's off target throws. He has one of the yeah, lowest yeah. percentages of off target throws. He's completing more passes than anyone in the league, um, and yet his offense has a ceiling, right? Because there's when when you ask your quarterback to just throw a catchable ball, which is at the core of what Pete Carroll wants from his quarterback, something he learned from Bill Walsh. When you when you ask them to just basically be that. There is a ceiling on that, and Gino is showing it. He's literally completing more passes than most of the quarterbacks in the league at a higher rate than literally every quarterback in the league. In Seattle's offense, stinks at least statistically. Right, it's not. It doesn't stink. It's like mediocre. But that's the point. That shows kind of a kind of a philosophical flaw in just requiring your quarterback to throw a catchable ball. You know, that's uh, that's an interesting thing. It's only a three game sample, but. When I look at Gino, I kind of look big picture at like the philosophy of, again, the most popular guy in the franchise. When you look at Detroit's defense, obviously they rank in the in the bottom third of the league in just about every major statistical category. They're you know, last in points allowed, um, last in red zone defense, which are very much related. I'm just curious, as it relates to, to Seattle's offense, which you were just talking about, just what's, what's, what's the vibe going into this game? Do they see this as maybe an opportunity um, to, to get right or make some plays against a, a Detroit defense that struggled three weeks into the season? Yeah, they, uh, of course. Although they feel like they can score on, on anyone. You know, that's what made their, their San Francisco loss so frustrating. They quite literally did not score any points on offense the entire game. That's, that's embarrassing. You know, they won't say that's embarrassing. I will call it embarrassing. Like you practice all week to score points, go out there and score zero, man. That's 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 getting your butt kicked, um, especially when you're not turning it over a ton. Yeah, the Detroit's defense is lacked in a, in a lot of areas. Um, I think one interesting comment that we've already heard from DK Metcalf is uh, he was asked uh, the other day. This is the, this is the question. The question matters here. He said, "Hey, Jeff Akuda has been locked. He has locked down three very good receivers this season. What are you seeing from him? You know, on film." And DK said, he's got a safety over the top. He's not really locking down anybody, you know, but he's a good corner. I thought that was very interesting. DK is usually very complimentary of opposing corners. You know, I asked about Emmanuel Mosley, I think, of the Niners last week. And I asked him about Patrick Sartan uh, Jr. Uh, before the Broncos game. And he usually gives the same spiel. Like, oh, this guy's a good corner. Respect his game. Yada, yada, yada. Um, perhaps it's because it's how the question was prefaced, which I think is very important because it kind of baited sure. him into that type of response. But either way, he took the bait, you know 
which was <laughs> very, very interesting to see. I've never seen him, you know, do that. In my, and this is year four of covering him. Maybe it speaks to how these guys see a matchup they can ex- exploit. Now, maybe not just with Jeff uh, on DK, but just in general of a Lions team that's not really, it's getting a decent amount of pressure on the quarterback, but blitz is pretty, more than pretty much everyone in the league and giving up explosive plays at just about the same rate as the Seahawks, which is pretty bad. Like, I'm sure they see this as an opportunity to score some points. They felt the same way about Atlanta, you know, too, but still lost the game. So for what that's worth. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I was actually going to ask you about it because Aaron Glenn, the defensive coordinator, was asked about that, you know, today too, about those comments. And, and you know, he he's, he kind of made it seem like that that might be something Jeff might be interested in, in hearing if he hadn't already. I'm sure Jeff already has. But he just kind of made the point, well, yeah, look, that's 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 how we play defense. That, that, that's how defenses are. We're going to man up the best matchups, but if it's a linebacker, it's a safety, whatever it is, that's that's just how you play defense. And, and we're going to continue to do do so but it was certainly something that that you know he took notice of and I'm, I'm sure Jeff took notice of so that should be an interesting matchup at any time DK and Jeff who has played pretty well the first three weeks get get squared up I want to switch gears a little bit talk about that defense you got some young players on that defense you know especially on the outside at cornerback the Lions are dealing with some injuries at the skill position um that skill position spots at, at receiver tight end running back might not have DeAndre Swift I'm just curious what you've seen from that defense the first three weeks and is it just a case of, of, of some young guys, you know, kind of getting into the mix? And, and do you see them progressively getting better as, as the year goes with as many young guys as, as you guys are playing over there? I mean, I, I would like to think they get better. Uh, if they start going the other way this early in the year, year that's that's a problem. And some guys do. All young guys don't just progress on a linear line. Some guys like peak in like week five of their rookie year and then just don't don't have it. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen to some of the young guys they're playing. But because that's a possibility, this is why there's such a disconnect between how front offices view players and how players view players in some regard. Like veterans are like, yeah, okay, I may not be running a four three right now, but I'm not going to blow all the assignments that a young guy might be if you just grab him right out of Ohio State and stick him in the starting lineup. You know, like I think that that is real. I remember being told on this offseason um, by some people around the league, like when they cut Bobby Wagner, it was very clear that they were trying to get quote unquote younger and faster on defense, which most teams are in the offseason. Those are two pretty popular buzzwords. But I, I kept getting reminded by people, younger and faster does not always mean better. You know, like your speed doesn't matter if you run the wrong way, <laughs> you know, if you or if you don't 100%. know where you're supposed to go and your gap or whatever. And I think um, I think that's been illustrated in some of Seattle and some of the things that Seattle has given up you know, in his first first few games, you know, whether it's the 67 yard touchdown that Judy, Jerry Judy scored over rookie cornerback Kobe Bryant and Kobe's second snap uh, in the end of, in the regular season, he gives up 67 yard touchdown, loses his leverage um, in, in the slot on a third down situation. You know, it doesn't matter how fast Kobe was at the time or how much, how little his contract matters to another uh, slot cornerback gave up a touchdown, you know, like but some of the young DBs have had penalties uh, on them. Would they have those? You know, if they're veteran guys who have kind of got a feel for how the league's covering things, you know, some of the young linebackers have blown run fit assignments. Same thing with some of their corners uh, and some of their edge guys as well in the run game, which is why their run numbers stink. So I think it'll turn around because some of these guys will just naturally get a feel. They will have that stuff on tape to review. They can get cussed out by the coach and they can fix it and get better. But those are the growing pains that you have and what some veterans will point to and be like, well, see, that's why you don't just cut me for some fifth round pick out of you know, out of Bama, because I'm not going to blow that thing, you know, whatever, you know, so, but, you know, they're more expensive too. It's a give and take. That's also fascinating on big picture level, but gen- specific to this game, I do think, yeah, yeah, a lot of those guys will get better. Kobe Bryant will get better. Tariq Woolen, their starting right cornerback, will get better. Boye Mafe, their second round pick out of Minnesota, is going to be a beast in the run game. Uh, I think passing might take a little bit, but they have some guys, I don't know how well any of those guys will play on Sunday, but like, we revisit this in like week 14, like some of those guys might be really on the track to be solid players in their careers. When you took a look at this matchup in this game, what, what were maybe two key matchups that you thought would, would, would end up being the difference in this game come, you know, four o'clock on, on, on Sunday in Detroit? Yeah. The thing that a few things stood out. Um, one is that the lions run the ball really well. And I think that'll maintain as long as most of the linemen are healthy. Like I know Deandre is very good, uh, but I just think that, like if you if the blocking is relatively the same, you can put a comparable running back like Jamal in there and get it done as 
you saw against the Vikings, you know, like Jamal just went, went and got busy. It was probably the most popular fantasy pickup of week four, you know, because of what he was able to do, you know, with, with DeAndre out. So that, that matchup was very interesting because Lions are not just good at running the ball. They're great <laughs> at running the ball. And the Seahawks aren't just bad at run defense. They're really bad, at least through, through three weeks. So that jumped out as like the first thing. The second thing was looking at some of the pressure stuff because I was curious how Aiden Hutchinson has been doing. Um, so I look at some of the team's pressure numbers. Like, wow, the pressure numbers are, are decent. I was like, but like no one's really popping other than Aiden. Aiden had the three against Washington. So I was like, what's going on here? And then I looked and like, I think the Lions are like third in blitz rate. They're like, oh, yeah. Okay. They're sending, they're, they're sending folks at the quarterback. They send pressure. <laughs> yeah. And forcing the quarterbacks to, um, to, to operate at a high level at a very short amount of time. I, I would be very curious to hear from uh, Glenn if that's like ma- been matchup specific. Cause I, I think Carson Wentz and Kirk Cousins are historically pretty bad against the blitz. So that may have just been like, we're blitzing those guys because they stink at it. Whereas if they had played Josh Allen and Mahomes in weeks two and three, maybe it would have been different because those guys cooked the blitz. That's kind of interesting. But where does Geno fit, fit in that regard in terms of the blitz? That's a good question. So, so far, so good. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a big enough sample size to really know, like with Kirk and Carson, so they've been starters for a little bit. So we have a really large sample against them, against the blitz. Generally yeah. speaking, he's not, Geno's not as good. Uh, against the blitz but most quarterbacks are not but that is probably the matchup on the other side of the ball that's that's interesting when then when when Detroit does get to send in the house on those passing downs how how does Geno react does he make the check to DK does he hit the hot route so far he's been very good on third down um in that regard so we'll see those are my two matchups kind of on each side of the ball that kind of jumped out before I was even really able to watch a lot of film Again, I'm talking to Michael Sean Dugar from The Athletic. Uh, He does a great job covering the Seahawks. One final one for you, Michael Sean. The Seattle Seahawks are 2-2 and and, and get a big win in in Detroit. If what? Um, If they're more physical than Detroit. And and, and that really – that can – uh, manifest itself in so many different ways you know you can be better in the trenches that way you can hit the hell out of the the receivers or the tight ends in the, in the passing game in that way you you force turnovers usually when you're the more physical team you get sacks usually when you're the more physical team there's just that's why you hear you guys know dan campbell's probably talked about that <laughs> literally every day is you know having a tough physical football team because when you make that your theme it can on any given Sunday, it can be, you can, like I said, it can be forcing turnovers because for forcing pressure, it could be just putting the fear of God in your opponent. Like the Seahawks did in the 20 and uh, Super Bowl 48 against the Broncos. Like there's so many ways to beat the opponent. If you are just tougher than them on that, on that day. So while we talked about some specific matchups and I think those will obviously matter. The main thing is the team that just kicks the, like is more dedicated to kicking the crap out of the opponent is going to win this game. I think it's well said, and I think it's two teams that have kind of kind of branding branded themselves on being that kind of um, you know physical type team. So I think that's a great point by you. Great stuff, Michael Sean. Really appreciate it. you. Have safe travels out east, and uh, I'll make sure and stop by and uh, say hello in the press box. Have good have a good trip over. Thank you for having me. Appreciate. It. Look, I had good food last time in 2018 when I went to Detroit, so I'm looking forward to it again. Oh yeah, it's it's become a foodie town now, so you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I ate good there, so yeah, like, again, I'm looking forward to it. All right, thanks again. We'll see you in Detroit. Welcome back to the 20 Minute Huddle podcast, and I am joined now by Captain Linebacker, Special Teams Extraordinaire, (laughs) Josh Woods. Josh, thanks for taking the time, man. I appreciate you coming on. No, thanks for having me. You know, I wanted to have you on because, and and I know we talked about this before, kind of coming up, is I, I just don't think Lions fans, you know, value how important you are to this team and how important special teams are to this team. I mean, you're a guy who's, you know, annually the leading special teams tackler, you know, your team captain. And then, you know, you look at last year, they get some injuries. A guy that steps in at Denver has, what, 13 tackles, two tackles for loss, a quarterback hit. I mean, just being one of those guys that can just step in and really do a lot of different things, wear a lot of different hats. How much pride do you take in, in being one of those guys that, that can kind of do a little bit of everything? Um, I mean, that's who I am, you know, uh, just my football career in general. You know, that's always been – kind of uh, uh, what I do best, you know, mm-hmm. just being able to adjust, being in adverse situations. Uh, but it, it means a lot, you know. Uh, I'm honored to wear that patch, the captain patch this year, first year. Um, and uh, 
it's it's a blessing, you know. Yeah. I look at every day as a blessing to be in this building, being undrafted, practice squad. Like I know what it's like on the other side if you mm -hmm. don't do those things, if you aren't the re dependable guy, you know. So yeah. um, that's that's really that's what it is every day. What was that day like for you? Because captaincy, that's something that's voted on by the players, right? Coaches mm -hmm. have nothing to do with that. that that's nothing else. That's inside that locker room. That's the respect that you garner from the guys that you go to war with on Sunday. So, mm -hmm. so how much did you value that confidence from, from your teammates and, and, and that vote as, as being one of their captains? Uh, I, I'm not going to lie. When, when Coach made the announcement, I mean, I had goosebumps. You yeah. know, it's, uh, it's like that uh, – it's nothing like respect from your peers, yeah. you know, um, but it's definitely a challenge. You know, I can't have those. I can't have down days. I can't have days where you know something's not right. But I owe it to those guys. You know, um, very appreciative of you know the the captain patch. I really am. Okay, there's one other thing I want to talk about here, and it was one of the funnier moments of Hard Knocks. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. The head goes down right away. And it was one of the most amazing things, and I don't think people saw it right away. And, and I hope if you guys haven't seen it, you're going to go back and watch the Aiden Hutchinson dance again because during this – all of a sudden, a shirt comes flying through the air. I mean, he's doing great, right? Mm -hmm. You guys are getting all rowdy, right? I think it's Jared Davis, right? Takes his shirt off, hurls it. You're in the front row. And, and first off, were you were you a guy that always sat in the front mm -hmm. row? Were you, you were that kid in, yeah. in, in school? Okay, yeah. I was the backseat guy closest <laughs> to the door, like way back there. So Jared starts hurling this thing around, throws it, and in one motion, I mean, you didn't even turn your head. You catch it, and you start going with it. What was that like being in, in that in that moment there? It seemed like it had to have been a riot. Yeah, no, that, that was the best rookie performance I've ever seen, so shout out to Aiden for that. But the whole time, I like I catch it, I see it, we're we're going. <laughs> did you wonder where it came from? That's like... that was the question that I had. So everybody's like, How did he see it? How did he see it? No, who threw it? Because where did this shirt come from? You know? But I, if you if you watch it really closely, I'm I'm like checking for checking a quick who, second. Who doesn't have a shirt on? <laughs> Because yeah, it no. was great all in one motion. I mean, you're going to the catch, to the keep it going. I mean, it was seamless, I have to say. Yeah. Your yeah. athletic traits were on full display right there. Yeah, with that no, one. That was my that was my best moment of camp just in general, <laughs> I think. So special teams, obviously you're a huge part of it. You were fourth most special teams uh, tackles in the league, I believe, last year. Um, but there's a huge emphasis here with Dan Campbell on, on, on special teams. You watch a practice during um, training camp, during OTAs or whatever, there's a lot of time and resources spent on, on special teams. What is it like to be part of a unit where they're so valued by the head coach like that? No, it's great because it's not like that everywhere. Um, coming from Maryland, Coach Durkin put a huge emphasis on special teams. Um, so it, it's, it really just, you know, kind of just rolled on over. It was great to be a part of a uh, uh, unit like that where we do put so much effort into it because it's so important you know it probably gets the least amount of publicity least amount of tv time, until something goes wrong until something goes wrong <laughs> and then it's what are those guys doing you know but i mean punt, punt's the most important play in football what right. like how many plays like on average or are, are guaranteed 40 plus yards punt you know mm -hmm. it's the it's really the only phase it's so important you know things like that we work punt three four times a week um it really just allows guys to really work on their craft, uh, allows guys to compete because guys on the look team, I mean, they're fighting for jobs too. Yeah. Uh, so we really get a great look and it's easy on Sunday when we do when, when you do it like that because you don't want the game day to be the, the first time you get tested. Right. So um, it, it's, it's a great it's a great way to go about and attack special teams. You guys were seventh in Rick Gosling's, you know, rankings each year. Do you guys pay attention to those rankings? No. I know he's he's no. one of the ones that, you know, does it every year. But seventh, I mean, you were one of the top units all across the board. You're good. Jack Fox is a terrific punter. I mean, your cover units were, were really, really good. Dave Fitt strikes me as a very detail-oriented mm -hmm. guy. I mean, he's great with the media with us. I'm just curious, you know, behind the scenes, what, what kind of coach is, is Dave? I like Coach Fitt a lot. Um, because not only is he super detail oriented, but he also listens, mm -hmm. right? So I'll be able to come off the field and he'll ask me what I see, or I'll tell him like, hey, I think they're doing this. And right away, like we'll talk about it, we'll have a check. And as soon as uh, that same phase is back up, that like he takes exactly what all the players are saying into account, you know? And I think that's what helps the, uh, the whole unit work 
because we're in constant communication. It's not a my way. If it doesn't work, we're just going to keep doing it, keep doing it. Like, no, he, he listens to us. We're the ones out there playing. You, know? you almost feel like you have ownership of it. Yeah, bit. Kind of like sure. what we talked about with Jared in the offense, right, and going to him and creating the schemes. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. like that's the same way with you guys and yeah. having that ownership of it. Yeah. Now, you started your career, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a defensive back and a wide receiver. When did the transition come to linebacker for you? Um, when I didn't get signed at my tryout for rookie mini camp, with the Bears in 18. Okay. You were a safety at that point? I was a safety. Okay. And you, so you were safety all through college? Last two years. Okay. Yep. So by the time I got to college, no more receiver. Yeah. I was playing a uh, corner when the Durkin regime got there, switched to safety. Um, and by the time I got to Chicago, I was probably like 216. They were like, after this was post practice, yeah. they were like, oh, yeah, no, we're. Learn some stuff about the box. Come back vet mini camp. We'll see what's up. And that's when they signed me. How'd you gain the weight? Oh, steak and potatoes every day. Shout out to Coach Keith. I know he's probably going <laughs> to listen to this. Yeah, steak and potatoes every day for lunch for five weeks. Worked. Wow, and it worked. So how much did you gain in that time frame before you came back? Uh, I was, when I signed, I was a little, I was like 236. Oh, wow. That rookie year, I got up to 247, but that was bad. Yeah. That was bad for my back, bad for my knees. <laughs> I remember specifically there was a play in individual where I just dropped to both knees because I had a back spasm. I was like, yeah, 240, that's my cutoff. Can't yeah. do that. But, yeah, so I'm, right now I'm rolling at, like, anywhere between 30, 35. Feels good. It feels good. It yeah. looks good, too. Appreciate I mean, it. you are really valuable to this football team. Special teams, defense, you're one of those guys that kind of does it all. You had a – you know, you. I love the fact that you appreciate – how you got to where you are because it wasn't like everybody else mm-hmm. you know you weren't handed a big check and a first round pick and all that other stuff you worked to where you you know needed to be you've done a great job you're a really valuable part of this football team thanks for joining me i appreciate, appreciate you it. yeah thanks all right thank you It is time for the Bet MGM key matchups. And like always, I've got five of them. And this week we're going to start with one I kind of talked off the top, but it's Jeff Okuda and DK Metcalf. Obviously, you, you know, we talked about the comments that DK Metcalf, you know, made about Jeff this week. Um, Jeff's playing terrific. I, I talked off the top, you know, about the, the 36 yards per game, no touchdowns, 74. Point six passer rating. He has been great. And, you know, if he continues on this trend, it's really going to allow, um, you know, Aaron Glenn to do some creative things coverage-wise. Maybe we see Jeff shadow a, a receiver. And I think that'll be the interesting thing about this matchup is, will he be shadowing DK, um, you know, Metcalf? Because Metcalf is a different kind of beast than Justin Jefferson was last week. And all Jeff Okuda did last week was um, hold Justin Jefferson to two catches in nine yards. Um but DK Metcalf, six foot four, two hundred thirty-five pounds, four three. Look, he's got thirty touchdowns and over three thousand three hundred yards in his first three years in the league. I mean, he is a big play threat. He's physical. He's strong. He's hard to tackle. And so, you know, I think when those two are matched up, you know, Jeff hasn't been afraid to mix it up and, and, and put his hat on guys in the run game, be physical on the outside with receivers. So, you know, I, I kind of just selfishly hope we see that matchup quite a bit because I'd love to see how Jeff Okuda responds. Can he keep you know, DK Metcalf down? I think that'll be one of the big, big matchups in this game. Number two for me is Jared Goff, quarterback for the Lions, and Quandre Diggs, who I know Lions fans will know, the safety, um, you know, who was traded to Seattle, um, you know, a few years ago. But when, when I look at, at Jared and the way he's got such control and command of this offense, he's, he's playing terrific. Look, he's got eight passes of 25-plus yards. That's third most in the NFL behind only Mac Jones and Patrick Mahomes. Um, he's eighth in QBR, and, and I think he's coming off arguably his best game of the season last week. Um, in Minnesota where, you know, he was able to use his legs, evade pressure, really had command of the offense and knew where to get the ball and got it there on time. Um, you know, I think he, his stats could have looked a lot better if, if they connect on some of those plays down the field that, that weren't necessarily his fault. So, um, 
you know, I think he's playing great. And, and you're playing a guy in Quandre Diggs who's looking to become only player in NFL history to have six straight seasons with at least three picks. I mean, that's what he does. Um, he gets his hands on the football. He's he's very savvy. Um, and so that, to me, is is a key matchup there. Can, can Jeff... Uh, can Jared, excuse me, manipulate him with his eyes a little bit, keep him out of, of some passing lanes. And, and if you're Quandre, look, you, you that's a young defense. You're a veteran guy on that defense. You know that to make a huge impact is, is turn the ball over. That's going to be huge in this game, obviously, for two teams that are both looking to go two and two with, with a big win. Turnovers are always the key stat in wins and losses. So can Jared keep it away from Quandre? Can Quandre you know, help his defense out by getting a big turnover? That's a key matchup to me. Number three is is DJ Chark versus Tariq Woolen, the rookie cornerback for Seattle. We're going to have to wait and see with, with DJ. Obviously, practice limited fashion um, on Wednesday with an ankle. Didn't practice Thursday, but I, I still see him going. Um, yeah, he wasn't one of those ones that, that Dan Campbell seemed overly concerned about when talking about the injuries on Wednesday. So um, for, for this, I'm going to expect him to be playing. And, um, you know, he's the, the healthiest of those, of those guys, I think, in terms of Amon and 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 uh, Josh Reynolds, Josh Reynolds returned to practice on um, Thursday, but but I, I think Chark's got a really interesting matchup this week with, with Tariq Woolen because they're similar type guys. Um, look, DJ Chark was brought here to to be that taller 50-50 guy, make those plays down the field. And when I look at at Woolen, six foot four, two hundred and five pounds, um, you know, four three type guy. Um, he was, he's been thrown at 12 times this year. He's given up six catches, and quarterbacks have only a 40.6 passer rating with throwing against him. He's been pretty good to start, and so I would expect him to be matched up against DJ. Just physically, they, they match up well against each other. DJ's 6'4", you know, over 200, 4'3", type guy well. So they're very similar type, um, you, know, you know, body mold, speed, physicality, the same thing. So, you know, Detroit just missed with DJ on a couple big plays. I know he had a hot start to begin, and, and I don't know how much that ankle injury maybe played into you know not having as much production in the second half, but um, that's a guy that they want to get going. Um, you know, Jared Goff has talked about that, 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 that they need to kind of get that connection going. We saw it a little bit more last week. I would continue, or I would expect – to, to see that continue to to kind of trend in that direction and so you know can he find himself you know open downfield Tariq is a rookie rookies make mistakes as we all know so can he find himself behind the defense can he make a big play and can him and Jared kind of connect and, and be a difference maker for Detroit's offense I think that's a key matchup in this one I'm going to go right back to, to you know, Detroit secondary and, uh, you know, the Seattle receiving core because I do think um, it's one of the better receiving um, cores that the Lions have faced early on this season. And, and to me, Amani Oriwarie and, and Tyler Lockett um, or the combination of, you know, Lockett and Jeff Okuda and Oriwe and Metcalf. However, it, it turns out, I just think those are two really huge matchups on the outside. Obviously a tough week last week for Amani. You know, he had, was flagged six times. They accepted four. Or, um, and, you know, I thought he had a little bit of a target on his back with some of those calls. I went back and watched. A, a couple of those were a little bit iffy. But still, it, 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 it's something that uh, Aaron Glenn and him have worked on this week about lowering his hands and working on some technique stuff. So, you know, we'll see how he bounce, bounces back. The thing about Imani is, is you know, he's a pro, right? And he's one of the few guys on that Lions defense that can turn the ball over. We saw it with the six interceptions um, last year. You know, he's a guy that, that, you know, they need him to play well. Um, for that defense to play well. Lockett needs just one touchdown to be fifth on the all-time Seahawks touchdown list. So obviously he's been doing it at a high level for a long time. He leads them in receptions, leads them in yards um, this season. Um, so between him and DK, you know, that's a tough ask for, for Jeff Okuda and Monty Ariway, but it, it, it's why I think this is such a huge matchup. Lockett last year, five games with at least um, 100 yards receiving. So he's He's kind of that 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 big play, that go-to, that consistent guy at wide receiver. Um, the Lions need Amani Oriwari to have a bounce-back game this week, and, and we'll see if he can do it against Tyler Lockett. And I want to end, finally, with this one. Aiden Hutchinson uh, versus Abraham Lucas, rookie right tackle for Seattle. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, you know, coming off that game, you know, week two with, with three sacks, the momentum was so high, and then, you know, he suffered the, you know, um, 
thigh injury, the, the Charlie horse. I don't know how much that affected him. He was obviously slowed in practice. He played last week, but only one quarterback pressure. I think that was his only statistic that showed up. It, yeah, he just needs to be more impactful than that. He's got a rookie matchup this week. Even though that rookie has played you know, pretty well, he hasn't allowed a sack in three games, but he has allowed three hits, four hurries, or four hurries for seven total pressures. So, you know, he... If, if you're Aiden, you've got to go into this matchup thinking, okay, hey, I've got a rookie. Um, even though I'm a rookie, um, you know, I, I, this isn't kind of one of those veteran guys that, that that's, you know, They've been around for a long time, had, has built up that repertoire um, and, and, you know, that film study to, to be able to really kind of shut down guys on the edge. So if you're Aiden, you've got to really look for a bounce back week. And, and much like we talked about with Monty Oriwari, I think he's got to play well. Jeff's got to play well for this defense to be better. Aiden Hutchinson has to play well, too. And, and the Lions need to pressure Geno Smith. Look, Geno's completing 77% of his passes. He's very much an on schedule, um, you know, throw the ball where you're supposed to type quarterback and so um, you know I, I think it's huge to, to kind of speed up his clock get him off his spot um, and, and Aiden and, and Charles Harris are, are the two guys that that you know are going to be tasked with doing that but for me it's it's the number two pick is, has got to really just step up and uh, give you more than one pressure I, th- I think the expectation can't be three sacks every week obviously um, but you got to have more impact than, than one pressure um, he's now going to be you know a couple weeks removed from that injury he, he, he didn't have the sleeve in practice this week. He was at practice all week. So I would expect him to be, uh, you know, much more ready to roll, much more ready to create havoc. And, and he's going to have to if the Detroit Lions are, are, are going to be better defensively this week on Sunday. So those were your bet MGM key matchups. Michael Sean was terrific um, previewing Seattle. Josh Woods is great. And you guys have to go to his Instagram page because he's hilarious over there. Obviously, big game Sunday. PJ Clark and I will be at Ford Field breaking it all down. So stay with us. we got a lot more coming as we get ready for Detroit and Seattle Sunday at Ford Field. <laughs>